Kia ora, good evening. Police have released the name of the pilot killed yesterday when his plane crashed near Poolburn, central Otago. The deceased pilot was Raymond Vivian Crow, aged 56 of Queenstown. Two other occupants, believed to be tourists, are in a serious but stable condition in Dunedin Hospital. Their injuries are described as non-life-threatening. The airline company involved is Glenorchy Air, who regularly take tourists on scenic flights over locations where the Lord of the Rings movies were shot. The Transport Accident Investigation Commission and Civil Aviation Authority are now in control of the investigation and police are working with them to investigate the cause of the crash. And the names of the two injured tourists have just been released. They are Texian couple Sarah and Eric Hoffman. Unemployment has declined to its lowest level since March 20, 2009, settling at 5.6% for the June 2014 quarter. More people are moving into employment with the annual number of employed rising 3.7% in the Household Labour Force survey. Employment growth in Canterbury accounted for almost half the total national employment over the year, while demand for workers from established businesses rose 2.3%. Annual wage inflation edged up, driven by private sector annual wage growth of 1.8%, influenced by a 3.6% hike in the minimum wage according to Statistics New Zealand. Dairy product prices have slumped to the lowest level since October 2012 in the latest global dairy trade auction. Dairy product prices dropped 8.4 per cent overnight, bringing prices to their lowest level since October 2012. Since the last auction three weeks ago, Fonterra cut its forecast 2015 Farmgate milk solid payout to $6 per kilogram, down from 7, citing increased global production, warehouse stockpiling of product in China and slowing demand in emerging markets. While international prices remain high for cheese and butter, milk powder prices have slumped 41% since February. The impact of the declining prices is not expected to be felt at the farm gate immediately. The water tap was ceremonially turned on today in Bluff to mark the end of a project that's seen the entire 30 kilometre length of the water main from the city replaced. The City Council has spent 18 months and six and a half million dollars replacing the all-important pipeline to ensure a reliable water supply keeps the Bluff homes and businesses running well into the second half of this century. Uh, the old pipeline, late in the late 50s, was um, prone to frequent failure. Uh, we've had uh, Today, um, this year, we had an occasion of two failures in one day. So you started uh, at the beginning of last year. Progress, that's 30 kilometres. Is this uh, running to schedule time-wise? A little bit later than um, the original schedule, but not too bad, really. And under budget? Uh, yes, just slightly under budget, yes. What was the material used um, and how long? And why was that material chosen for the pipes? Uh, polyethylene is a material that's been used for the uh, replacement pipe. Um, it seems to be gathering quite a reputation after the uh, Canterbury earthquakes as being a, a good material. Effectively this new pipeline is one pipe from Invercargill to Bluff because the sections of pipe are welded together whereas the old pipeline and perhaps other types of pipeline have several rubber ring joints. This one has no joints because it's fused together. Was there a temptation to do it in stages or was it always envisaged that if it was to be replaced it would be all done at once? I think with the nature of failure over the recent years it was obvious that the whole length of pipeline needed to be replaced. And so that is about the lifespan of that sort of asbestos pipe, 55 years? Uh, we'd hoped for a bit longer than that, 65 years, but uh, it's proven not to be the case here. So this water comes from the city, from the treatment plant, Branksholm does it direct to here? Well, it comes from our treatment plant at Branksome through into our city reservoirs, goes through our city network, and then we, uh, the city network is connected to the Bluff pipeline. So that storage tank behind us, this is where the water ends up and then it's distributed, for, uh, pumped from here? That's right, yes. How long is this uh, pipe expected to last? I guess everything's got a working life. Well, at least 50 years. It's very hard to get guarantees in today's world, but we'd expect this pipe to last more than 50 years. 
Invercargill blind woman Carolyn Weston is applauding moves by the Electoral Commission to introduce dictation voting for this coming general election. The new system will allow not only sight impaired voters an easier voting option, but will also help any New Zealander with a disability cast their vote. Dictation telephone voting means that people will be able to vote over the telephone instead of going into the um, you know the voting the voting booths and they will be able to make a secret vote instead of having to rely on somebody like a family member or a friend they can do this secretly because they'll be able to ring up and they speak to one person who gives them their number and they that person will sign off the name and the number together and then they pass them on to another person in the electoral office who will then um, let them cast a vote and the person will tell them who they want to vote for and that will mean that that vote will be secret because the second person doesn't know the name of the first per you know, of the person, they only know the um, number. It's not only for sight impaired people or blind people, is it? Other people can make use of this service. Yeah, anybody with a disability, a physical disability, uh, if they've got an intellectual disability or vision impairment, they can go um, and register with the um, Electoral Commission and that will be two weeks before the voting time starts and then they'll have about 10 days or two weeks that they can actually cast their vote. So you don't have to vote on the actual election day, you can vote up to the election day and the dates will be published later on. Still to come on the bulletin, dirty roads, conflict resolution online and the police need your help. Welcome back. Four motorbikes were stolen from Invercargill City on Sunday night and police are appealing to the public for help. Overnight on the 3rd of August, a burglary was committed in the Turnbull Thompson Park area where four distinctive motorbikes were stolen. These images are similar to those of the stolen motorbikes including a Levita, a BSA Lightning, a Honda CB72 and a Honda XL500. If anyone has any inf information or has seen the bikes, they asked to please contact the Invercargill Police on 2111 or anonymously you can call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 New building, dwelling, new dwelling building consents have reached their highest level since August 2007 and have doubled since March 2011. In June, seasonally adjusted figures show the number of new dwellings consented rose 3.5%. In unadjusted terms, that's 1,950 new dwellings consented. Canterbury had the bulk of consents issued at 623, while Auckland had 553, which includes 120 apartments, according to Statistics New Zealand. In Invercargill, there were 132 consents issued this, in June this year, well down on last year, according to Simon Tonkin of the Invercargill City Council. Mud and muck are posing a serious safety risk on some Southland roads this winter. Farmers and contractors are urged to keep roadways clean or risk bearing the clean-up costs. One of the big issues is that it can create a safety risk. Um, on our sealed roads, as an example, the, the mud and gunk on the road um, can cover up, the, say, the, the pavement markings, so the centre lines or the edge lines. Um, that's obviously a safety concern, particularly at night or in bad weather conditions. The other thing is, particularly if it's um, been quite a dry, a bit of a dry spell and it rains, um, it can create or cause the road to be slippery. Um, and then for our gravel roads, it also uh, impacts on the integrity of the, the material we're putting on the road. So you have this uh, less suitable material mixing in with the, the gravel on the roads. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite a wide variety of impacts that it can have. Uh, this time of the year we obviously um, can have quite a few cold nights um, so if there is stuff that's been dragged onto the road that's got quite a bit of moisture in it uh, there's a risk of that freezing up and yeah, it can become as hard as stones really and then if vehicles travel over that they can flick that up um, so yeah it's all about safety is one of the big things. As uh, far as uh, farmers and potentially contractors go is the idea that they would stop at the farm gate and hose the wheels down before they, they get onto the main roads? Um, it can be a variety of options that they could do. 
one of the probably the, the easier things is to make sure that those access ways are actually constructed appropriately with the right material. So the material, so anything that is stuck actually comes off, or a large portion of it comes off before they get onto the road. Um, another option might be is uh, when they say they do in their preparation for winter is making sure that everything's prepped up and um, say uh, bailey just put out um, pre-winter or before we get the really wet muddy months um, so that can help reduce the number of movements they actually have to do into those paddocks um, so i don't think it's just necessarily one thing it's just a variety of options considerations it is something that farmers uh, can be held accountable for financially there's obviously a cost to going out and cleaning it up and depending on the extent of, of the mess, the cost can vary. It might be as simple as just uh, getting a broom out and sweeping it off. Um, the, the maintenance trucks have electric brooms that they can use, uh, but in other cases if it's too extensive uh, there might be a lot more work involved uh, in trying to clear the material. How often is Council doing this and um, what sort of costs are farmers faced with? The dollar value can be from um, as little as a couple of thousand dollars to even close to ten thousand uh, dollars depending on the the frequency of it um, and the, the extent of the mess. More parents are resolving disputes outside court only months after government's family justice reforms. Since reforms came into effect on the March 31st, 562 assessments for the New, Zealand New Family Disputes Resolution or FDR Mediation Service have been completed and another 530 are in progress. Unnecessary conflicts, delays and expense are being avoided with parents being empowered to resolve matters in dispute without going to court. Of the 122 mediations completed, almost three quarters were settled out of court. The website has had around 1.7 million views since its launch, more than double that of the old family court site. Stay with us, sport is along next after the weather when we'll look at Division 2 Club Rugby final highlights from the news team. Good night.